A lot of people call it flexible spectrum usage, dynamic spectrum sharing, dynamic spectrum allocation. I prefer to call it dynamic spectrum access. Why? Because what we are trying to do is accessing the spectrum. It's useless that we put levels to a problem that we already know what it is. We want to access the spectrum, so it's dynamic spectrum access. So, <clears throat> and let's define dynamic spectrum access. Series of techniques and methodologies that allow different cells, users, system, you, you pick up one, to use the same channels or bandwidth or whatever from a shared pool. That's the principle, dot. You can interpret as you want, you can use different policies, you can be nice, you cannot be nice, compare respect to the others that are using the spectrum, but the dynamic spectrum access has to be separated from its own application, because dynamic spectrum access does not mean only detection of spectrum modes and primary and secondary usage. That's one application. Dynamic spectrum access does more. Because the other problem, for example, is how to do dynamic spectrum access among pairs. So if we are all equal, we need to do dynamic spectrum access as well. It's not that we, we invent something different. The same thing. So that's the reason why we need to call it in the same way. This is a distributed dynamic spectrum access technique. This is as old as the world. That's what Wi-Fi does every time you, you, you switch it on. It's dynamic spectrum access, because it does, it, it's done in time domain, sorry, time domain sharing, it is sensing based, and it makes decision if using or not the spectrum. The decision is dumb, yes, I know, but it makes a decision. <laughs> is it correct? Yes. Yeah, so we can say that Wi-Fi is cognitive. No, of course not. This is just a provocation, but we need something more advanced than this one because the problem is that it does all of it, but it's completely inefficient. We are more or less under 40% of the possibility of usage of the spectrum. For example, now a real dynamic spectrum access technique, which is called spectrum pooling, is one of the first techniques that came out that from 2004 from Weiss and John Doe. It's done at the physical layer, so this is a physical layer stuff. And what we are basically saying is that we interlace our own carriers. For example, if I have a primary system which has holes here and there, Let's assume that you have a system like OFTMA. I don't schedule all the, all the carriers I have, I just schedule a part. And then if I adapt myself to that type of signal in order to still be orthogonal to my primary user, I can use what the part that it is not scheduling. Main principle. Very, very simple. It's called some kind of interleaving. Deactivate the subcarriers, and then you have the secondary system that poof jumps in as soon as I have a, a hole in the subcarriers. How much is feasible in real time? Eh. We all know that, for example, in LTE, you need to have the equivalent in time of five microseconds of difference of jitter max which corresponds to a certain amount of kilohertz in frequency without disrupting the other signal. You need to be extremely precise. Which means extreme tight synchronization between primary and secondary. How do you do it in real life? You don't. Game theory, that's another extremely hot topic. There is a summer school for the ones who didn't see the, um, the, the advertisement before. This is one of the algorithms that we, uh, that we made, just as an example. And it's fully distributed. And what you do, 
if you want to use a channel, first of all, you try to see how much capacity would you get from that channel. And then you try to be nice with the others. That's how the game works. If we all are nice to each other, we all gain. So this means that I have this one, which is called the, we call it wasted capacity, or we can be interpreted as the capacity of the rest of the world. So if the world is using that channel with high capacity, if I reuse it, I screw up a lot of capacity for the rest of the world, so I'm not nice. Point number one. And second, if I am already using a lot of channels, I need to pay more taxes to use another one. The more I use, the more I pay in taxes. That's uh, how the, the society should work fairly well, for example, in Denmark or in Scandinavia regions. You are a wealthy man and you need to pay more taxes if you want more. Let's call the taxation, all of it. This is the weighting function, given the percentage of usage of the number of channels. Voila. And what you get out of it is the utility function that defines your game. And if you maximize the utility that you get, you suddenly you have your set of channels to use. Each of the channels gives a utility, different utility. You try to use only the channel that gives you a positive utility. A negative utility means that you are paying so much, so much, so much in taxes that it's not worth it to use the channel. This one, for example, is another cooperative DSA where I made the decision on my own, but I tell the others my status and how much the others could potentially harm me. That's another algorithm that is coming from us and uh, at, is designed for LTE. Um, it's available on the literature, there's not much to say. That's basically what Oscar is doing every day uh, in his PhD. So the idea here is I sense the environment, so the UE send me the, 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 the measurements. I, I get the cell load, so if I am loaded, I need to select more channels. I exchange with the others the channels that I'm using and how much my users are affected by the transmission of other cells. And then you get some, uh, some specific decision, but the decision is really, really dumb. It's trash to compare them here. There's no... Also, this one is suboptimal. It's graph theory inspired, but it's suboptimal. This one is, is fully graph theory based. Uh, also, this one is suboptimal. <laughs> we don't do optimal stuff. Uh, also, this one is based on the same evaluation of, pot of potential interference from uh, uh, local UE feedback. So it's, each cell gets its own decision. The only difference is that they are able to agree on which set of channel to use. So we establish uh, um, a direct agreement depending on the click size of the graph. Have you ever heard this term? Do you know, are you familiar with graph theory? Yes? Yeah, I guess uh, uh, it's like a set of uh, vertices that have the same number of neighbors, something like that. It's, it's the maximum size all the fully connected network of a fully connected uh, loop. These three are fully connected. It's the maximum size of a fully connected graph. And what we try to do is we try to optimize the allocation given the click size, because the click is the one that gives me how many neighbors I disrupt, basically. Uh, this one, of course, requires, it's another type of cooperation, it requires a, a more intense you know, usage of a control channel. 
because I need to establish an agreement, so I need to go back and forth. And basically, the function that we optimize is the normal fun it's the normal function for graph following. It's the same optimization. The only thing is that we establish an agreement and we do it all together because we know in each of these loops how many colors I need to call the graph locally. It's a bottom one because it, it's local. All the decisions are made locally. And then there are, of course, other theoretical frameworks. Uh, for example, I mean, Lagrangian optimization is one of the most used because it's one of the most optimization theory uh, you applied in real life. There is game theory, which is widespread, but we don't want to uh, want just to tell you that it exists. Auctioning, auctioning is a subset, for example, of game theory. It's, it's become it's becoming extremely famous especially with this database access, centralized access, and so on, where basically the, the nodes participate to a centralized or distributed auction when we put some bids, and there are different types of auctions that are coming from the economic literature. So we are not even talking about science anymore. We, yeah, let's say it's science. Uh, but it's not engineering anymore. We are talking about economic. As same was game theory in the beginning, Nash received the prize for economic. Uh, or graph theory, graph coloring. Uh, these are the most applied techniques today for deciding which and how many channels I need to use. All of them can be designed being distributed, cooperative, centralized, up to you to decide and to use it. And the problem can be extended not only to the spectrum, but you have time domain, you can use it, you can go down to the scheduling level, you can decide to schedule a user in one channel or another, you can use the power domain, you can use the core domain. If you have other domains, feel free to use it. All of them are just providing a theoretical framework. What you put inside, it's up to you. So, as we were saying, coexistence is an open issue. Because what happens when we have different systems sharing the same map? And in which domain we should solve the problem? Time, spectrum, both of them, power, code? I don't know. That's depend on the application. It depends on uh, the systems themselves. Because some of them don't, do not have code, for example. Some other cannot have the control power. And then is who needs to take care of the existence? Because we can have on one side the regulation guy says, no, no, we need to take care of coexistence because we want to be sure that nothing bad happens. Or it's technology saying, nah, don't worry, regulators. We are smart and we design smart system and we do smart optimization. Open issue. Both of them are trying to do the same. We will potentially end up in a pitfall where the technology would be would allow us to do something and the regulators will ask us to do the opposite. See the case on white spaces. Uh, and where the intelligence need to be in the system, because it depends on the amount of knowledge that the, the system need to have, if you need to share it, uh, which is the cost of sharing it with the others, do you need a control channel, do I occupy the bandwidth? Uh, is it the optimal solution? How much optimal do I want it? Uh, how can I apply it in reality? Because if we would say, for example, let's use uh, uh, something that exploits a heavy usage of control channel in LTE, the LTE guy would say, no, no way, we need to minimize the control channel because otherwise it's a hell over the air. Or they would say, no, no, use all the information you want. We have the X2 via fiber. Use it. It's fair. No one is using it. That's the on application. And everything depends on the architecture. There is no architecture yet in cognitive radio. We need to define one. Otherwise, we will never go product. And that's the main point. And that's the point that creates me the biggest problem. Because um, 
if we do not have a product, we will end up always, and I'm saying always, trying to do academic work, pushing the academic work, doing massive amount of simulation, doing maybe some nice tests but to show in a demo, but we will never go to market. And the market, we will always believe, ah, you academician, yeah, cognitive radio. And then we come out with another great idea, and we, yeah, you're the cognitive radio guy, yeah, yeah it will remain like cognitive radio. We need to be believed by the market. That's the message I'd like to pass to you at the end of the day. Because if the market does not believe us, we will remain academicians. It's a very nice job, I have to admit. You are free to do whatever you want. But in the long run, even as an academician, it will not pay off because we need the money for, from the market to run our projects. Otherwise, sooner or later, the uh, actually, more sooner than later, our funding agencies will start saying, hey, how many products did you have about this technology? None. Ooh, nice. Will you fund me again? No. <laughs> the European Union is now pushing towards product. We have a strap project, which is a kind of supposed to be a kind of a search one. And they are asking us, have you presented it to operators? That's the first question that the reviewers tell you. If you are not in the market, you're out of search. So be aware what you do, guys. I don't want to scare you, but <laughs> think about that the things that we do need to be applicable. Let's close us today's lecture. Thanks for the.